My pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Syed Jaffrey. Uh, Syed is the president for the regions in Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, he's a friend of the center of the school uh, for many years now. He's on the advisory board of our center for several years. He started out as an engineer in Pakistan, uh, then came and studied in the US. And I think his first job was in the UK working in pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then he went to the, uh, the probably the best uh, training school for management, which is General Electric, where he spent 18 years, and uh, including an assignment in China. And I think at some point then he transitioned over in 2005 to Thermo Fisher. And his rise within, within Thermo Fisher since then has been meteoric. He started by heading a business uh, within China, then heading that business globally, then becoming head of China, then becoming head of Asia, then becoming head of all emerging markets, and now essentially the head of all international uh, markets for Thermo Fisher. Uh, he is uh, going to speak to us about their strategy in Asia Pacific, but also in some of the emerging markets more uh, generally. Some of the things you might not know about him from reading his bio, he's a terrific squash player. I think he uh, could have probably had a career as, as a professional sports uh, sports uh, player of squash, but uh, decided to go in a different direction. And uh, so he's very competitive, and uh, and I'm sure that's a quality that helps as he's dealing with the competition. So Syed, thank you so much for making time for us. Please join me in welcoming Syed Jaffrey. So as we are getting the presentation up, uh, let me just uh, start uh, with uh, um, introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, it is a pleasure being here. Uh, Ravi has been uh, uh, an outstanding friend, and uh, he has done a great job in terms of uh, creating uh, the, the awareness of uh, the importance of uh, Asia Pacific and, uh, and emerging markets. And, uh, and, and you know, I'm. Uh, Pleased to be a part of uh, uh, the, the the center that he has created. Uh, my my relationship with uh, Northeastern, uh, I think, is uh, going to get even stronger <laughs> moving forward uh, because uh, my son, uh, who was at uh, Colby College, uh, a freshman, uh, decided to actually transfer to Northeastern. So starting in September, uh, he'll be a student right here in in the business school. So I'm really happy. Looking forward to you know have him uh, here. I think he'll uh, have a great uh, experience uh, being back in, uh, in the Boston area and, and at a terrific uh, university. Uh, so I'm going to spend some time uh, to to share with you uh, Thomo Fisher's uh, perspective on uh, what we call high growth and emerging markets. Uh, and you will notice that I said high growth and emerging, and and it's sort of a new uh, kind of a take that we have. On, on these markets, uh, and this is very fresh. I mean, we haven't talked about this uh, uh, with too many people uh, in the past. Uh, I just presented uh, uh, to the analysts of Thermo Fisher uh, in New York uh, just about two weeks ago, and that's the first time that we started to distinguish between what we call high growth and emerging, and I'll uh, share with you as to what we, uh, what we mean with that, because uh, we are seeing a distinction uh, in, in those two uh, categories, okay? So let me just uh, start uh, very briefly with uh, a quick intro on, on Thomas Fisher. So Thomas Fisher, uh, it's uh, uh, a Waltham uh, headquartered company, uh, has been uh, in existence uh, for over 100 years. And uh, what you see on the screen is just a high-level view of uh, our presence in, uh, in different markets, right? So the company is uh, about $23 uh, billion in revenues. Just about 10 years ago, we were uh, under about 2 billion. So we have grown uh, tremendously in the last uh, uh, 10 years, both organically and uh, through acquisitions. Uh, we have uh, four kind of distinct uh, groups. Uh, that basically are made up of almost a hundred different businesses we have in the company. So uh, four is probably the best we can do in terms of defining uh, what we do. So on uh, the top right, 
what you see is uh, the life sciences solutions business, right? This is the business uh, where uh, we have products uh, uh, and technologies, for example, in the area of next-gen sequencing, uh, genetic analysis, for example, products that are used by pharmaceutical companies if they are producing vaccines. So we will provide them products that are used in the production of, uh, of vaccines, for example. If you look at the bottom right, uh, these are the products that are used uh, mostly in laboratories. So if you walk into a lab, uh, almost any lab, you will see Thoma Fisher products, whether it is a biosafety, uh, biosafety cabinet or uh, a pipette or chemicals or plastics uh, consumables, uh, Thoma Fisher is present in, uh, in the lab. As you move uh, uh, to the left, uh, that third business represents our specialty diagnostics business, right? So this is the business uh, that enables, for example, doctors to diagnose certain diseases. So diseases or the viruses like uh, Ebola or flu virus, for example, or if uh, you go to a doctor and you want to know what type of allergies that you have to food or you know, any other uh, substances, uh, it will be uh, very likely that it is a Thoma Fisher product that the doctor is using to detect uh, those, uh, those diseases. And then on the top uh, left is our business, uh, which is focused on analytical instruments. So here, you know, we would uh, produce technologies like uh, uh, mass spectrometry, uh, electron microscopy. Um, and just to give you an idea that these technologies are being used by researchers who are Know, perhaps uh, working on drug discovery, uh, the, the researchers who are working on uh, developing potential cures for cancer, for example. Electron microscopy uh, came into our company recently through the acquisition of a company called FEI. So just to give you an idea that, that how advanced that technology is, that recently uh, a team of scientists who won uh, the, the Nobel Prize in uh, chemistry uh, they actually were using uh, our electron microscopy instruments in their lab. The, the instrument is, uh, you know, so powerful in terms of expanding the image that one way that I describe it is that if you are on the moon and you have an electron microscope, you can actually look at a tennis ball on the ground, you know, let's say in Shea Stadium, and tell that what brand the tennis ball is, right? I, I mean, that is... The, the level of magnification that we have uh, in that technology in, uh, in the microscopy. So that is just a high level view of, uh, of the company, about 75,000 people all around the world, and about 45% of our people are in, uh, you know, in regions outside the US, so those are under my responsibility. So just a high level view of uh, our presence uh, in uh, high growth, and uh, emerging markets. I won't go through the numbers, but you can see that, you know, about 15,000 employees, right? So what you see here is that you will see a number of countries in Asia Pacific, but you would not see, for example, countries like Australia, uh, New Zealand, and Japan, because, I mean, they are developed markets. I mean, we don't look at them as high growth or emerging markets. That is why you don't see them. But then you also see uh, some of the countries uh, from uh, Eastern Europe, for example, uh, some of the areas like Russia, Middle East, Africa, all those are a part of our high growth and emerging markets uh, uh, businesses. And, you know, they are being supported by about 30 manufacturing facilities and a number of our development centers are based uh, in, uh, in these countries. In terms of uh, our, uh, our strategy, right? So, especially in the last 10 years, what we have focused on is building presence, building infrastructure in these regions. So I was uh, Tom Fisher's uh, president for China about 10 years ago, right? And when I came back from China, uh, I was asked by the CEO that we need to start establishing infrastructure, country leadership in these countries, right? So about eight years ago, you know, we did not have uh, organizations like uh, uh, you know, what we have today as a, as a country president uh, in, uh, in India or a country president in Japan or Latin America or Middle East, we did not have these roles. So we built these, uh, these organization structures literally over the last uh, eight years. And uh, so that has been a key part of our strategy. 
The second thing is that when uh, you know you are operating in these countries and you want to generate the level of growth that you see up there, 17% growth every year, and 10% of that is organic. It is not just because we bought companies. We drove 10% average growth in the last six years every year just based on our current businesses, right? Uh, to do that, right, you cannot treat uh, these countries as outposts. You have to have presence there. Uh, a customer in China who buys a million dollar mass spectrometer is not going to accept that if they have a problem or if they need training that, you know, somebody from Europe or the US will arrive there in two months. They, they want the, the quality of service, uh, which is as good as any customer, you know, at MIT or Harvard using our mass, spect mass spectrometry, for example. Right. So we established uh, application development centers. Uh, we uh, are using our technology development centers in China and India and in Lithuania, for example, in, uh, in Eastern Europe to, to basically, uh, you know, make some modifications in our technologies based on the local customers. Right. So those are, you know, the key elements of, uh, of our strategy. And the last one is manufacturing that we you know, established uh, factories in China. We are expanding our presence uh, in, in India, for example. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about you know, how we are leveraging these markets, not only as source of growth, but also as an incredible place where you can develop technology, you can manufacture products. And, and those are you know, as good, if not better, quality than what we are able to do in Germany or California in the US. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So, <clears throat> so I, may, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to distinguish between high growth and emerging, right? So these are the regions that we are now calling uh, emerging markets. And when I presented to the Wall Street uh, two weeks ago, uh, there were a lot of questions because they said this is the first time we are hearing that somebody is actually distinguishing. And they say, we don't see China here. Uh, we don't see India. We don't see Korea. And our point was that those three countries, we believe that those are high growth market, right? And the difference between those and these is that in those countries, you know, we deliver double digit growth consistently every year, right? I mean, our company depends on them every year to absolutely grow uh, without any doubt in our minds, right? But the countries that you have here, these are emerging markets, but the record is mixed, right? So Brazil, you know, about seven years ago was growing 10 to 11% as an economy, right? Just about a year ago, Brazil was literally in a depression, you know, negative one, negative 2%. Middle East about six years ago, five years ago, well, it was doing very well because the oil prices were at a good spot. But as the oil prices went down in the last uh, about two, three years, you know, I mean, the investments in the, in the Middle East uh, literally just stopped, right? So, so our view is that these are very important markets, but we have to be pragmatic and smart about how we invest in these markets. We cannot just say that, you know, because they are emerging markets, let's just keep investing. Uh, because the risk is that if you are not seeing enough return, your investors are not going to forgive you. I mean, they are expecting financial results every single year, every single quarter, right? So our view is that we are definitely dedicated to these markets. Uh, the positive thing is that Latin America has finally started to make comeback. And we can see that in our financial results. Brazil is, is getting better. Uh, even though there is still some political uh, instability. Mexico, uh, uh, we are watching in terms of what happens with the, the whole discussion around NAFTA, uh, but we are seeing uh, improvement. We are seeing better stability in their currencies versus what was going on a couple of years ago. Same thing about the Middle East, right? Middle East is now making a comeback. I mean, we are beginning to see more opportunities in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, in UAE, in Qatar, for example, and then Southeast Asia. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, tremendous opportunity in countries like uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, where there is still some, you know, political turmoil, but the markets are relatively uh, stable, uh, and Vietnam, right? Those are the countries where uh, the markets are still small, 
but uh, the growth is in the 10 to 15 percent range in terms of uh, what we are seeing uh, in our business. So I hope that you know helps me understand that the the difference that we have. And you notice that when I showed you our overall emerging markets growth numbers, right? And I said that was organically growing 10 percent and and 17 percent, uh, you know, with acquisitions. But here you can see that the growth is about five percent. So that is a difference, and, and that is why. We, we are calling them uh, out uh, as a separate group. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, these uh, these three countries um, that are extremely important to us. And I'll just uh, you know start with uh, uh, with China. So in uh, in China, the government plays a big role in terms of where the economy is going, right? And uh, at least uh, in, uh, in in the businesses that we are involved in. Uh, the government spending does matter to us. And uh, when you look at the Chinese government's five-year plans, right, the, the 13th five-year plan that they introduced, basically it's almost like a business plan for a company, that this is, you know, where they're going to invest. And what you see here is, you know, the key areas where the Chinese government is planning to invest uh, during these, uh, the, the five years. So healthcare, biotechnology, extremely important, right? I mean, they are, uh, spending enormous amounts of money in uh, doing breakthrough research, for example, in developing uh, uh, drugs uh, based on biotechnology, very much focused on precision medicine, uh, for example. And I'm sure you hear a lot about precision medicine, uh, you know, these days. Uh, and I'll just make a couple of comments on that. So precision medicine, um, you know, if I were to describe that in, in, in simple words, uh, it is about... Uh, using human beings uh, genetic makeup to determine uh, what is the best way to diagnose diseases for example if somebody has a problem or or, or, or a disease uh, and secondly uh, coming up with uh, drugs that are uh, suitable for each individual have uh, the right level of uh, efficacy in terms of the impact on a person's health right i mean that is what in a nutshell precision medicine is all about and the Chinese are very much focused on that because they are aware that the, the, the nation is aging, right? I mean, uh, there is an incredible increase in diseases like cancer, uh, especially lung cancer. Uh, smoking is, uh, is the cause. Uh, there are uh, huge issues with, uh, with diabetes, uh, with uh, uh, inherited diseases, for example. So healthcare and biotech is a huge focus for them. Then uh, large investments are being made in uh, environmental uh, areas uh, to ensure uh, that there is improvement in the quality of air and, and water, right? So I, I mentioned to you, I lived in China, not once, but twice. Uh, and you know, when you live there, you, you recognize what a blessing clean air is. That, you know, you wake up in the morning and you don't have to worry about, you know, your lungs uh, puncturing, uh, you know, 20 years from now, right? Uh, so, so those are, you know, some of the issues that the government is trying to deal with. Semiconductor industry is going to boom in China. You know, today, Taiwan and, and uh, uh, Korea are big producers of semiconductors. Uh, and by that, what I mean is, you know, chips, right? So the chips are being used uh, in almost everything that we do. You know, your self-driven cars uh, that you'll have uh, five years from now. I, I mean, everything is going to be relying on chips, right? And China is going to become the largest producer of semiconductors in the world. That, that is what their plan is. And they are planning to spend about $60 billion. Why am I talking about you know, this being important to us? Because I mentioned to you this uh, acquisition that we have of a company called FEI, electron microscopy. I mean, that is uh, one of the largest uh, companies that is involved in the production and the research of developing uh, uh, chips in, in the semiconductor industry. And then food safety is the other area where the government is uh, developing labs uh, that are going to be used to detect uh, you know, any quality issues with the entire supply chain of food safety. In terms of Thermo Fisher presence uh, in, in China, very quickly, we have about uh, uh, over 4,500 people, a number of uh, factories, technology development center. Uh, we are making investments uh, in areas like uh, uh, developing more digital capabilities. So e-commerce, e-business, um, developing uh, capabilities to help our customers 
diagnose uh, issues with their instruments or their equipment long distance. So software, analytical uh, instruments, absolutely the key to succeed in, in China. And you can see our record in, uh, in China that we have been growing over the last six years, organic growth of 16% uh, on, on an average basis. So uh, China has been uh, an amazing source of growth for us uh, in, in the company. India, very important market in uh, last uh, you know, few years, we have seen some changes uh, in India. I think uh, some of the reforms that the, the, the government is conducting there in terms of uh, uh, making the system less bureaucratic, the consolidation of uh, uh, you know, the, the taxes, for example, with the GST uh, implementation. Uh, you know, short term, maybe uh, those uh, did cause uh, you know, some uh, issues in terms of disruption in the economy, but we do believe that longer term, those have uh, benefits for, for the Indian uh, economy. Uh, India is uh, a big producer of uh, generic uh, pharma, so you can see some of the, the customers there. Uh, customers like uh, Biocon, Zydus, Cipla, uh, these are big customers of, uh, of Thomas Fisher. Another great thing about India is that India has uh, an amazing uh, number of uh, engineers, technical folks, so the intellectual capital is, is incredible. And we, and we leverage that as well, right? So as we develop uh, you know, any software-related applications in our company, uh, Thomas Fisher Cloud, for example, all that development is done in India. So we have an IT uh, center of excellence in Bangalore with about 500 software engineers. They are the ones who are leading our entire effort in the software development for the company uh, in, in India. South Korea, uh, you know, here, uh, somewhat like China, the government is very involved in, uh, in investing in uh, innovation. Uh, they are uh, very involved in working with small and large companies in uh, providing funding. Uh, and again, uh, here's another place which is uh, the largest producer of biosimilars uh, in, in the world, right? So almost a quarter of uh, the biosimilar pharmaceutical production in the world takes place in, uh, in South Korea. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, the semiconductor industry. So companies like uh, Samsung, for example, uh, they are you know, some of the largest producers of uh, uh, semiconductors uh, in the world. And uh, here you can see that you know, literally about uh, 10 years ago, I had, uh, I think, 35 people in, uh, in Korea. It's about 600 right now. So huge uh, increase in terms of our local presence in, uh, in Korea. Let me just check something. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that we also leverage these markets as, uh, as a source of technology and manufacturing, right? So what you see here is you know, some of our manufacturing operations. So if you look at uh, you know, countries uh, like Czech Republic, right? So Czech Republic and Singapore are the two major hubs in, uh, in these so-called emerging markets where uh, we are producing some of our best technology, right? And they are producing these products uh, that are absolutely on par with uh, you know, anything that we do in the US or Europe. Uh, and then areas like China and India, uh, we are producing products that are uh, you know, more tailored uh, to the emerging markets, the high growth markets. Uh, this is where we are able to make some uh, adjustments uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in some cases, if, if a customer doesn't want all the bells and whistles that may be required in, in a US or a European uh, environment, we are able to make those adjustments using our operations here. And then uh, one area that I wanted to point out is the operation that we have in, uh, in a city called uh, Vilnius, which is in Lithuania. And what I wanted to show you here is that you know, it's a great example that how we took uh, uh, a place which not a lot of people know about. I don't think most of you hear about Vilnius on a daily basis. That you know, this is where we established our uh, center of excellence for our life sciences related products, life sciences reagents, right? Uh, so back in 2010, uh, we acquired uh, this site, uh, uh, came through an acquisition of a company. Uh, the, the employees there did an incredible job in uh, adopting the Thomas Fisher uh, best practices in quality, for example, 
and built an operation that about two years later, you know, won this uh, very prestigious award called Shingo Prize um, that was given them for uh, the operational excellence. And then from there onwards, they kept on improving the quality and the capability of uh, the operation to the extent that in 2014, we established there what we call the GMP manufacturing. So good manufacturing practices. Uh, and basically uh, after that, uh, you can see at the bottom that Thomas Fisher ended up winning awards like the employer of the year, uh, most admired business in the country. So it shows you that, you know, a, a small city in, in, a, in a small country, uh, what they can do in terms of talent and, and what we need as a global company in terms of high tech production and, and development of products, that all of that is happening in, uh, in Williams. So just to wrap up, uh, in terms of the key takeaways, uh, you know, for us, uh, the, 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 the reason for our success has been, uh, as I said earlier, uh, establishing local presence, right? Um, when we started to build our presence in these regions, right, we had a lot of expats initially who, just like myself, who went to, ran, to run China, Korea, and so on. But today, you know, the, the president for my Japan business is a Japanese. Uh, for the Korean business is a Korean woman. Uh, Indian business is uh, an Indian, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? Brazil, Latin America is run by a Brazilian and a Mexican. Uh, they, they manage Mexico and Brazil. Uh, so the point there is that, you know, you have to hire uh, the best talent that you can locally uh, to be successful. You cannot uh, treat these uh, areas as, uh, you know, sales offices where you send uh, expats, you know, who take their own time to learn about these markets. And then the question is that, you know, is that the right strategy? And our strategy is to go local. And then um, from my investment perspective, uh, most of our investments actually go into these markets. This is where we invest. Uh, almost every new factory that we build that is being uh, built uh, in, in these areas. And then the last one is that, you know, these markets have been a growth engine for our company. And, and our view is that, you know, you hear a lot about geopolitical um, noise these days. And, and our view is very simple, that geopolitical things can happen and we cannot control that. What we can control is our own destiny. And that is in terms of you know, where our customers are, how do we do the best job in serving them? And we still believe that these are the markets where tremendous amount of growth will come. And these will be China, this will be India and so on. And, and we will stay the course in terms of, you know, working through all the, the ge geopolitical aspects of uh, what's going on in the world today and, and continue to invest and, and make sure that, you know, we are gaining share. Uh, in, in, in. So that's a high level view. Ravi, if I have some time, I'll be happy to, you know, take any questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, so question, uh, clearly, uh, well, thank you, first of all, great, great presentation. Um, so clearly the investment in low cost, uh, you know, the capabilities, leveraging local talent for R&D growth area, as you, as you say here, what I'm curious about is with the in-country presence, um, are you, are you focusing on, I, I kind of go back to years ago, we talked about globalization, right? Are we, are we looking at, you know, localized product lines? or globally consistent product lines so obviously local presence to be in market mm -hmm. but from a product line with thermal fish are you talking localized products for the region or are you talking about kind of global investment on the product lines that you use and then sell them within market with local talent sure it's a good, great question so um you know most of the products that we develop right these are for global market right we also think about the economies of scale, right? You don't want to be doing too much tailoring in too many different places because then you lose that uh, the benefit of scale. But our view is this, that in markets like China, for example, right? Uh, sometimes we do see that there are customers who are looking for some adjustments or they don't want to pay that much price for the product. And those are the places where we will make some adjustments, right? But that is, not a huge percentage of our total product business, right? So I would say, you know, 90 plus percent of what we sell in these markets, these are global products, right? 
And then the other thing I just want to highlight is that, you know, we produce uh, about half a billion dollars worth of products in China, right? 90% of those are actually exported all around the world. 10% of those are being used in China. So the answer is that some tweaks in products for local markets, but mostly we still rely on global technologies. Uh, hello, thank you for your excellent presentation. I have a question that connects a little bit with the previous presentation of uh, Mr. Wang, and it refers to the idea of go going local, the tech war, and raising capital. So I see you are listed in the US, but I was wondering if in this effort, and in this, clearly you are pursuing this, and being very successful at it, at going local, you're also um, considering to raise capital in China or in, uh, in Asia more generally. And I'm specifically asking in light of the recent um, changing in the um, listing requirements. And as you know, now we have this company called Xiaomi, which in June is gonna be having the largest IPO in Hong Kong, change, thanks to the changing of the listings. And this is also happening in Saudi Arabia, in Singapore. So in a nutshell, I was wondering, you know, are you considering, um, you know, the capital markets in the US and in the UK are pretty dry. China, there's lots of liquidity. Are you, you know, considering yeah. going local also in raising capital? Okay. So, you know, in terms of capital, I mean, Thermo Fisher cap right now is, uh, you know, close to about $80 uh, billion, right? And uh, we believe that there is a tremendous opportunity to raise more capital in Asia, especially in China, uh, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Uh, most of our investors are today in the U.S. and Euro uh, in, in Europe. Uh, one of the largest uh, investors we were able to work with over the last few years uh, is Tomasek. Uh, which is uh, based in in Singapore, and they benefited uh, incredibly in the last few years through the rise of our stock. Uh, in China right now, we have uh, very little presence from a, a capital investment perspective. I mean, we have dialogues going on with companies in uh, in, in Hong Kong mostly. Uh, but uh, what we feel is that at least today, you know, in terms of our ability to do business in China, right? Th this is not a requirement, right? Uh, but we do think that, you know, in the future, uh, there is a lot of capital available in China. And, and, and we just also want to be very selective in terms of, you know, whose money <laughs> that, that, that we take and invest in the company. So there are some longer term aspects that we are thinking about. But right now, not, not a lot of Chinese investors in Tomofi. By the way, that was uh, Ruth Aguilera, one of our distinguished faculty members associated with the center. Uh, Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I have a question regarding intellectual property. Uh, how much is it an issue in the countries that you talked about and how do you deal with it? Sure. So, you know, IP is uh, it's, it's a big uh, question that we all uh, think about it. And uh, when we are, for example, manufacturing in China, um, we have been cautious in terms of uh, producing products there that are difficult uh, or close to impossible to copy, right? Because that is, uh, that is a concern. Uh, what we end up doing is that we end up using uh, Singapore and uh, Vilnius type uh, locations where we are producing high-tech products because the risk is less. Having said that, you know, we actually had very limited issues in China so far in terms of any uh, stealing of our, our IP. Uh, I know that there are other companies. Uh, I was the uh, other day speaking with the CEO of GM, Mary Barra, at a meeting. And you know, she, she was talking about you know, them having a lot of concerns about the joint venture they have in, in China for Buick. And they're developing new technology in batteries. And the Chinese government is saying that you have to share that with a local partner. And they have concerns, right? So some companies like them, you know, they have, uh, I think, issues uh, with, with the risk of losing the IP. In our case, you know, so far we haven't had any issues because we have been very cautious in terms of what we uh, produced it. Saeed, if I can just jump, if I can just jump in, uh, switch gears a little bit. Uh, 
how important do you think today it is in a company like Thermo Fisher that your senior executives have exposure to and experience in emerging markets? And I ask that knowing that you have not only had that experience, but you are from an emerging market yourself. You know, it's, it's uh, absolutely uh, important. I was actually talking to our CEO recently about uh, literally setting a criteria that anybody in the company who wants to become a president, and we have about 17, 18 presidents, that anybody who wants to become a president, they have to do an assignment in the emerging markets. I mean, that, that is what I was, I was proposing. Um, you know, if I look at our current leadership team, um, you know, three of our largest businesses in the company are being run by the, the presidents who work for me. I hired them and, and they work for me in, uh, in China, right? And um, as we look at the pipeline of leaders uh, for the future jobs, a uh, number of people on my current team, uh, you know, they are on the list uh, uh, to be considered for, uh, for some of those uh, big jobs. So in my view, you know, the world we live in, uh, the way we are becoming more and more global, uh, it, is, it is almost a requirement that if you want to be successful, uh, you want to have leadership, which is uh, one, uh, diverse, global, and, and secondly, understands that, you know, how do you operate in, uh, in different parts of the world? Hey. Uh, Anik? Hi, um, so I have two re related questions, actually. So how long are some of these um, expatriate assignments? Is it a couple of years? Is it um, as long as needed? And also um, for, do you have a systematic program like Colgate and Palmolive where you have this international career development program and it's more or less required to move up the, uh, you know, the corporate ladder? So to answer your first uh, part of the question, you know, normally people will go for two, two and a half years, but if they're really good, they may be there for five years or six years. Uh, it, it depends, right? So my, the, the last president that I had in China, uh, he was there for five years. The one before him was there for almost five as well. Uh, so so it, it can vary, right? But mostly we target about two, two and a half years. Uh, the second part of your question, you know, as I was, uh, you know, answering to Ravi's uh, question that I think that there is more we can do in terms of having more structured international rotation programs where people, you know, have the opportunity to go abroad and they are, uh, are pushed to actually do that. Uh, today, I would say that we do that more on an ad hoc basis, uh, but we recognize that we need to develop, you know, more structured programs to encourage more people to uh, take on global assignments. Okay. Uh, that was uh, Professor Anikun, also faculty associate of the center. Hi, speaker. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question on your assessment of the local competitors and your company's approach for collaboration or competition with the local players. Thank you. So, you know, in, in our case, uh, most of our competition, uh, these are multinational companies. And I think it is just because of the nature of technologies that we are producing. But what we are seeing is, uh, uh, you know, especially in China, that, you know, there are some incredibly bright people uh, who, who are, as you know, the, the top 1,000 program in China. I mean, there are people who are going back and they are, you know, as good as <laughs> any scientists or as any technologists in the world. And they are, you know, pursuing, uh, you know, some high-tech developments. We think that in about next maybe seven to 10 years, we will see more competitors coming out of uh, areas like China. Uh, but today, uh, very limited local competition, which has been a great insulation for us because uh, it is tough to replace us uh, with local competition, especially with what's going on these days with this whole you know, tariff uh, uh, dialogue uh, that uh, our technologies are needed and there are not too many local venues they can pursue to replace. Uh, Syed. You had a sort of an interesting and consistent strategy over a 10-year period, and the results have been quite remarkable. But for many companies that are traded on the stock market, there's a very short-term pressure. And how do, have you managed to satisfy the short-term needs while following a consistent long-term strategy? So I'll just share with you 
not a verbatim quote, but uh, from uh, when I was in GE, Jack Welch, who's a CEO at that time, he used to say that he likes long-term growth, but you have to deliver your quarterly results to pay your bills, right? And the view was that, you know, absolutely, we, we believe in long-term developments, but we have to do our job and we have to deliver on our commitments short-term, right? So that is how the company looks at it. You know, we, uh, this year, will spend uh, close to $1 billion on technology and product development, right? As I mentioned earlier, right, that uh, in the last 10 years, bought 100 companies, spent over $50 billion doing that. So, so we, we continue to invest, right? But there is no question that we have to deliver short term, especially the world that we are living in today that, you know, we just delivered uh, in Q1, you know, 7% organic growth in a $23 billion company, right? And the market reaction was kind of, okay, God for, for, forbid, if we had said that, you know, we missed our plan, we could be hit in terms of, you know, next day drop in your stock by, you know, five to 10%, right? So, I mean, that is just the, the nature of any business that short-term results are very important, but at the same time, we should not compromise in terms of just, you know, the short-term profitability and then ignoring the long-term because, you know, there's no way that will last another hundred years if, if we have that thinking. So the, new, the distinction between emerging and the high growth is one way to educate the investment community about the nature of your business. I'm sorry. It's... I mean, by making that distinction between the high growth countries and the emerging markets, you are preparing the investment community for the fact that one piece of it is going to be more volatile than the other. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, we, we just wanted to be clear as we looked at the, the land belt that there are variations in, in these companies that are in their block. And it is tough to talk about, you know, China in the same context as Brazil. We we'll say, look, I mean, people are running away from Brazil right now because of, you know, all the depression there. And, and we wanted to distinguish that. And it was actually very well received uh, by the investor community that they felt we are thinking on the right lines and, and not being, you know, naive in any way in saying, let's just keep spending because there is a word emerging attached to it. Uh, so we, we wanted to distinguish that. I think um, our time is up because we're going to... I have one last okay. question. A really quick and really quick answer. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, with the increasing evidence for new uh, immune oncology markers like pdl one TMB and such, uh, what do you think of the prospects of immune oncology and companion diagnostics in emerging markets? Oh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, uh, you know, the whole area of immunotherapy, right, both from a diagnosis perspective and from treatment perspective, uh, it is... It is going to become probably one of the, the, the you know the greatest needs that everybody's trying to solve, right? Especially with the unfortunate uh, uh, you know disease of cancer, right? Uh, so Tomo Fisher is extremely involved in that. We just held uh, uh, a precision medicine summit in Beijing, uh, first uh, of its kind. About 450 thought leaders uh, attended that. Uh, Chinese Academy of Science was a part of it. And the, the entire focus of that uh, uh, conference was basically, uh, you know, immunotherapy, use of precision medicine, what role, you know, Thermo Fisher plays, working with, uh, you know, both the large, you know, biopharma companies, but also some, you know, startup biotechs, uh, the academics in terms of, you know, really pursuing this goal that over the next eight to 10 years, you know, we want to see a cure for cancer. Now, we don't put that in our, you know, mission statement because, you know, it, it is a goal, it's a mission, but uh, I mean, it's a vision, but uh, that is how we are looking at, you know, immunotherapy. And there are some amazing developments that are going on, you know, and I don't want to throw a lot of technical words at you, but areas like, you know, uh, CAR-T uh, therapy, where literally, you know, I mean, uh, companies like Novartis, you know, they, they came up with these, uh, these uh, therapies where literally, you know, we are taking uh, uh, the, the cells from the human body and, and using those cells after some modifications to be injected back into the, com into the body and, and fight cancer, right? Versus, uh, you know, throwing a lot of chemicals in your body. 
So we are hoping that, you know, with some of the work that we are doing, and again, our competitors are doing that as well, that in the next eight to 10 years, you know, we see some real solid developments in addressing uh, disease of oncology and cancer. Thank you, Syed. Please join me in thanking Syed. Thank you. Thank you.